Hello everyone and welcome back to another video in the 1001 MSc Chemistry online tutorial series. My name is Brock Grant and today we're going to be going through the nomenclature of inorganic compounds. So this is actually quite a full on module. There's a lot of things that we're going to learn and it's quite easy to be confused by a couple of things. However, we should be able to get through it just fine. So uh, today we're going to be going through how to name different elements and ions. Uh, how to write formulas from the names of ionic compounds, uh, naming binary polyatomic ions, and how to name acids. Now, there are a couple of prerequisites for this module. Uh, you will be required to look through module two and module three, video one, as I believe they will be very, uh, very helpful and useful in getting your head around this module. Again, just a heads up of our video symbols. So we've got our stressed out owl over here, and that represents a topic that is, uh, or an area that is uh, often giving students trouble and that you may need to focus a little bit extra time and energy into that particular area. And we've got our student trap. So this is where students often make mistakes. And uh, when you see this, it should be brought to your attention and make sure that you don't sort of uh, fall into these, these traps and lose easy marks. Okay, so let us start now on how to name elements and ions. So something that you should be aware of is that there are a small number of elements called diatomic molecules. So what this means is that you have two of the same atoms that can bind together. Now, uh, a good sort of helpful tip, especially in an exam situation, uh, is if you see a word that you panic with or you go, oh, I don't know what that word means, try and break it down. So if we look here at diatomic, so we can see that we've got di. So di means two. And atomic, well, atom. So diatomic molecule is two atom molecule. So all it means is that you've got the same atom that's bound to itself. So some example here are O2, H2, Cl2. Now, why they bind to themselves like this will become much more apparent when we study Lewis structures and when we look at the actual shape of these atoms. Now, let's talk about ions. So an ion is a term for an atom that contains a charge. Now, remembering from our previous module is that what influences the charge of an atom is the movement of electrons. So that means a charged particle can be produced by adding or removing one or more electrons from an atom. Now, there are two new names that you're going to learn here that absolutely must be memorized. So if an atom is positively charged, then that means that it is called a cation. Now, how I like to remember this, and this is why I've bolded and underlined this T, is that a cation, so the T, looks like a positive. So cations are positive. Now, if an atom is negatively charged, then that ion is called an anion. So anions are negative, cations are positive. So let's look at uh, further into naming elements and, and ions. So something I'm going to introduce now is, is an extension onto our valence electrons that we were talking about in the previous module. And this is the octet rule. Now, when we have valence electrons, all atoms strive to get eight valence electrons because the P subshell has six electrons, or three orbitals, and the S subshell has two. So six plus two equals eight. Now, when we have a look at our periodic table here, we can see that at the end of our S and P, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this means that outer shell is completely filled. And this is a characteristic of the noble gases, which is in this column here. And that is why they are so stable, because they're basically content. They have their eight electrons. They don't want to bind to anything else. They don't want to undergo chemical reactions because they're happy just the way they are. All of these other elements, however, not quite the same story. So coming back now to the octet rule. So because each and every element strives to be stable, they all strive to have eight 
valence electrons. So what we can do is, with this newfound information of the periodic table and valence electrons, is that we can use that to predict how these atoms will react. So let's look at NaCl, so the combination of sodium and chloride. So this will form a compound called sodium chloride. Now sodium chloride is just simply table salt. This is the stuff that we, we put on our um, hot chips to have on the beach side. So let's have a look. So we've got sodium. So let me just uh, erase this here. So we've got sodium, which is over here. Now, how many valence electrons does sodium have? It will have one. It has one valence electron. Now, let's have a look at chloride, which is over here. How many valence electrons does that have? It has seven. So let us go back here. So, sodium, Na, it has one electron, which I'm just going to draw as a little dot here. And we've got chloride, which has seven. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, both of these atoms are in a little bit of a conundrum here, because you have chloride here, chlorine rather. Now, chlorine is one electron off having the full set and being stable. So it really, really, really wants to have that last electron to complete the set for it to go, okay, I've got my eight, I'm happy. Now, sodium, on the other hand, has overshot. So he's filled his outer um, ring of electrons. So he's gotten his eight. And then he's gone down to the next energy level and got one electron. So poor sodium has gone a little bit too far and has got too many electrons. So what happens here is that the sodium, uh, sorry, the sodium and the chloride attract to each other. Because for these guys to form eight, for chloride, it is easier for it to try and steal one electron than for it to try and get rid of all seven here. Whereas for sodium, what's easier for sodium? To try and steal seven electrons or for it to try and donate one? So for sodium, it is much easier for it to just cut its losses and donate this electron. And that way it will fall down to have its outer shell to have eight. So what will happen is, is that this sodium will donate its electron to chloride. That will form Na, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then we have sodium chloride. Now this is called an ionic bond because sodium has formally just gotten rid of its electron. It's gone, you know what, I don't want this, you take it. Whereas chloride has gone, I desperately need one and has taken it from sodium. Now let's look back at our previous slide, how we were talking about anions and cations. Now, sodium here has gotten rid of an electron. So because sodium got rid of that electron, remembering that an electron is negatively charged. So because he lost this negative charge, the sodium here got more positive because he got rid of it. So because the sodium got positive, it is a cation. Now, our chloride, it took this electron to become stable. So because chloride accepted that electron and electrons are negatively charged, it means that chloride got more negative, which means that chloride is the anion. Okay, let us now look at naming these elements and these ions. So, most often, ions are formed when a metal combines with a non-metal. So, remembering from our previous studies on the periodic table, this can give you a very big hint during the exams on how to name a compound.
So if you can see that there is a metal that is bound to a non-metal, there is a very high chance that it is bound ionically, and it should follow the following rules. So, if you are given the name, so you're given the actual name of the compound, and you want to write it as a chemical formula, here are the steps that you take. Is that you write the formula for the metal first. So, looking at our example before of table salt of sodium chloride. So, sodium being on the very far left is a metal. So, we would write Na first. Then, we would write the non-metal. So, we would write chloride. So, we'd write Cl. So, that's step, uh, step one. I sort, oops, I sort of jumped a few steps. Uh, step two here is to combine the smallest number of each ion needed to make the sum of all charges equal zero. Now, this is a very important part, and at this step here, will come up in a number of different modules. So please make sure you're comfortable with it and you're comfortable in being able to determine the charge of a particular atom. So when we looked at sodium here, on the previous slide, sodium wanted to get rid of its electron. So because of that, the sodium here was plus one because it donated one electron. That's all, that's all it had to give away. Now, when we look at chloride over here, chloride wanted to steal only one because it had seven valence electrons. It only wanted one to become eight. If it took more than one, it would have overshot. So it doesn't want that. Now, plus one minus one equals zero. It equals a neutral charge. And that is also shown. NaCl, if there's nothing written up here, it means that the charge is neutral, okay? If you don't see any reference to a charge on a chemical formula, that will tell you that it's neutral. If it said, now, this is completely incorrect, but I'm just using it to, to make an example. If I was to write NaCl2-, minus, now, obviously, that is wrong. But that would mean that the overall charge of the sodium and the chloride combined would be minus 2. So that's where reference to the charge would be made on the compound. So what you then uh, is, what you do is, if you do have an odd, um, odd ratio, you would then use a subscript to add the certain amount of elements needed in order to make the overall compound neutral. Now, this will be shown in the next video as I solve a couple of questions for you guys. Now, let's say we get given it the other way around. Let's say we're given a chemical formula and we have to build the name from that formula. So, what we do is, is we write the name of the cation first. Now, this is the one that's positive and is generally on the left-hand side of the periodic table, remembering that you've got all your metals. So, you then write the anion and you add the suffix. So, suffix means end of the word, I-D-E. So, for example, here, so N-A-C-L. So, we would write the name of the cation. So, the one that's positive. So, we would write sodium. And then for the, uh, the anion, which is chlorine, we wouldn't just write chlorine we would put chlor, instead of ene, we put id. And that's where that suffix comes into play. Now, just a side note, because this will be the type of thing that will be put in your exam to trip people up. This is one of those things that, that we use to separate those who sort of skims through the material and those who understand the material. And that is the use of these Roman numerals. Now, when we look at the, the metals that are in the, the, our transition metals, which are in the D subshell, um, the, they can be a little bit more complicated because they can exist in more than one state. So, sodium will always be plus one, always. But with, let's say, iron, iron can exist in either plus two 
or plus three. It depends on the situation in which it's in and it depends on what it's bound to. So how do we uh, distinguish between which one is plus two and which one is plus three? So, because up here we could always say, well, this will always be plus one, this one will always be minus one. So we know straight away that that's going to be our product. But when we got ion, it's a iron rather, it's a little bit more complicated because again, we don't know which state it's in. The answer is we use these Roman numerals. So if you see iron and in Roman numerals a two, that means it has a charge of plus two. So if we look here at iron chloride, we have Fe. Now because of this Roman numeral two, it is two plus. Now remembering from the periodic table that we looked at in all of our previous slides so far, chloride has seven valence electrons and it wants to steal one. So that gives it a charge of minus one. So if we've got two plus here, how many chlorides can iron two bind to? And the answer is two. And that is why it is Fe, Cl, and as a subscript, we write two. Now we have the charge of chloride, which is minus one, times two, that's minus two, and iron is plus two. Now that we're finished having a look at ionic compounds and the, uh, the binding of a metal and a non-metal element, let's look now to a binary compound containing two non-metals. Now, something I do want you to keep in your mind here is that non-metal compounds are molecular, not ionic. Something else that you should keep in mind is that you will only use prefixes. So a prefix is something in front of the word, where uh, in contrast to a suffix that's at the end of a word, you will only use prefixes on molecular compounds. So that's very, very useful. So make sure you keep that in the back of your mind. So let's have a look at naming a binary molecular compound. So the first thing you do is you write the first element and you only use a prefix if there is more than one. So if we look here at our first example, we only have one carbon. So we simply write carbon. What we then do is we write the stem of the second element. So the stem is sort of like the middle of the word. And then we add "-ied", to the end. Now again, a prefix on the second word or, or the second element that's bound here can be used if there is more than one of that particular element. So again, looking at this first one, we have carbon. So we've written carbon. Now we have oxygen. So we write mono or mon, which is one oxide because we've got oxygen and we replace it with ide. So again, looking at our second example, carbon dioxide, is we have carbon, so we just simply put carbon, and we have two oxygens on the end. So we put di, ox for oxygen, and ide. And our last example, which again sort of ties all of them together, is that we can see we have two nitrogens at the front here, so we put di nitrogen, and four oxygens at the end, so we put tetroxide. Now, here is a list of the prefixes that we can use. So we've got mono, di, tri, tetra, penta. So that's one, two, three, four, five. And this absolutely must be memorized. Again, if you do not know these prefixes, it will be nearly impossible for you to name any non-metal compound. So please, 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 please learn these prefixes as you will definitely use them. Okay, so now let's have a look at naming polyatomic ions. So poly simply means multiple. So polyatomic is an ion that contains two or more elements. Now, the rules here are very similar to the binary compounds. So these are the ones that we looked at before. However, the difference is in the suffix. So this can be a little bit of a mind twister here, but bear with me and we'll get through it. So if we have a polyatomic ion that contains, uh, for example, oxygen, 
it can t- contain the suffix ate or ite. Now, whether we use ate or ite depends on the molecule. So, for example, we can see sulfur is can be bound to either SO4, so four oxygens, but it can also exist bound to three oxygens. So, how do we differentiate this based on the name? So, because this SO4, it has more oxygens, it gets the suffix eight. Whereas SO3 has less oxygens than the SO4, so it gets the extension eight. Okay, now that we've finished polyatomic ions, we're now going to finish things up by naming acids. Now, there is a gigantic hint as to when you will be presented an acid in your exam. And that is that the chemical formula for an acid will always begin with a hydrogen. So, for example, if we've got like uh, acetic acid, so we've got H C O O H. So instead of writing C O O H 2, this hydrogen is at the front. And that tells you that you have an acid. Now let's have a look at the rules of naming an acid. So you use the same rules as naming a polyatomic ion, but there's a couple of different changes. Instead of using eight, you would use ik. And instead of using it, you use os. So here we have sulfate, and that sulfate turns into sulfuric acid. Okay, so you just add acid onto the end. So instead of sulfate, it turns into sulfuric acid. And here, if we have nitrite, that will turn into nitrous acid. Okay, so it's quite simple. So it's the the exact same rules that we learned in the previous slide. But instead of eight, it's ic acid. And instead of ite, it's os acid. Now, in your lecture notes on page 69 and page Sorry, I write that down. Page 69 and page 73, there are some absolutely fantastic flowcharts. Please use them. Okay, it is an absolutely excellent resource to help you in memorizing the pathway in which to name these inorganic compounds. And again, this is a very, very easy question for us to put in your exams, whether as a multi-choice or even as a long answer. And it is, it's easy marks that can uh, that can be scored on an exam. So please make sure that you have a look at these flowcharts and you learn these prefixes and suffixes to name these inorganic compounds. Okay guys, that's it. So we're going to finish up module four, video one there. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you took a lot away from it. Uh, if you could all please uh, look down in the description, there'll be a survey there. If you could fill that out for me, you'd be helping me out a lot. As again, that helps me to make these videos as, uh, as, as best as I can. Um, please also make use of the comment section down below. I'll be checking that as much as I can, and I'm going to try my best to answer as many questions as I can. Um, if you do have any questions, queries, suggestions, issues, anything like that, feel free to hit me up on b.grant at griffith.edu.au. Keep up the hard work, guys, and I'll see you next time.